That's my cue to start. Well, good morning, everybody. So, I hope we had a great uh, weekend. Hopefully, uh, a chance to start pulling together chapter seven through nine, or just resting up for this week. Um, obviously, our midterm is Wednesday night. Um, there's an announcement with information about it, hazard sample information sheet. I thought um, this week what we can do is just some review problems. If there's any topics or problems that you want to have uh, looked at on Wednesday, just shoot me an email. You can also come to office hours if you want to see them in person um, after class today and then tomorrow, or excuse me, on Wednesday, my office hours are 1.30 to 2.30. Uh, let's start with the born uh, Haber cycle. And so this particular cycle is one that has a few different utilities or there's a few things we can learn from looking at this cycle. One of them is that if you just start with the idea of elements in their standard state. So if we have magnesium solid and then chlorine gas, you could say, well, why would they ever form an ionic compound? And the answer you can see, um, or at least um, some support for why they form this compound, is this negative 641 kJs per mole to form MgCl2 solid, so that it's exothermic to make this ionic compound. If MgCl2 were endothermic, this probably wouldn't have been made as a stable compound. Now, the other thing you might want to know is, well, what is the delta HF of other things Mg and Cl could have done? Uh, we don't see those on this chart, but you can presume that other compounds like Mg2 minus Cl plus forming some sort of peculiar ionic compound probably wouldn't be as negative or maybe even negative at all in terms of the exothermic reaction of forming the elements into the compound. So why does a particular compound form? You could probably imagine that it's because that compound's more stable than other options. And it's more stable than the elements themselves, and then it's more stable than anything else that the elements could have done uh, with, with regard to each other. And then another thing we can learn from this chart is that if you start thinking about the energy it takes to ionize magnesium, well, we have to go from solid to gas, so we have to know some bit of information like a sublimation enthalpy or the enthalpy of formation of magnesium gas, so we can go from solid to gas magnesium. Um, then we have to break the chlorine-chlorine bond. All bond st strengths are positive, so every bond that forms between two atoms, energy has to be added to break that bond. So for the chlorine-chlorine bond, it's about 242 kJs per mole. You could also just know the delta HF of chlorine gas compared to chlorine two, which would be have a delta HF of zero because that's the elemental form. Um, and so if you knew how much energy it took to break that bond, you would also want to know how much energy it takes to go from Cl2 to two chlorine atoms. And so that's just breaking the chlorine-chlorine covalent bond. And then from there, we have to absorb energy in to ionize magnesium twice, so to magnesium plus. Even more energy, we saw that the second ionization energy of any element is always a, um, you know, a lot higher than the first. And it's a huge amount of energy more if we start removing core electrons. So if we try to remove a third electron from magnesium, it would take you know, probably five times as much energy. So we're stopping at Mg2+. Uh, apparently the background noise has ended. Um, and so then once we make magnesium 2+, plus, you can then imagine the electrons that we lost off of magnesium forming um, the chloride anion by being absorbed by chlorine. So we have the two electrons that were freed up from magnesium absorbed by chlorine to go to Cl minus. And at this point here, you might have thought um, that this is the, the point where this will make it clear that Mg2 plus and Cl minus form, but it's really not still. Like if you notice in terms of the relative energy, that we're still pretty high compared to Mg solid Cl2. It's not until you form the two plus and the minus and then they have that electrostatic attraction. So the lattice energy is that electrostatic attraction. And so the lattice energy is telling us how much energy it takes to separate the ions. Therefore, it's telling us in the opposite direction how attracted they are to each other, how much downhill in energy they go relative to each other. Um, so if we wanted to calculate the lattice energy, do you see here that what we'd be doing is taking 641 positive. We'd be then adding 148 and 244, 738, 1451. And then we're just simply subtracting two times the electron affinity, so 698 for the electron affinity twice for chlorine. And then that would allow us to calculate the lattice energy of MgCl2. So this will be 641 plus 148 plus 244 plus 738 plus 1451, and then minus 698. And I don't know if it matters if we calculate it, but let's just take a second and calculate this out. 
and then talk a little bit about the magnitude of this value. It is so quiet in here. So I get 2524. KJs, and that's per one mole of this compound. So that's 25, 24 KJs per mole. And so a few things. One, we might remember that NaCl was about 800. And so a 2 plus minus, even greater. Yeah. Um, why don't you do negative Yeah, so what I need to do is I need to go from here to here. Notice that it's the negative is from MgCl downward. So from Mg solid and chlorine down to the, um, the product, MgCl2, that that's minus 641. So if you start at MgCl2 and go up, that's 641. So like to go from here to here is plus 641. When we were writing this out in terms of a reaction, we wrote this out when we covered this earlier. We were writing out and starting from the um, mosquito up here. Um, MgCl2 goes to Mg. Um, solid plus Cl2 gas. Might have been one of the first reactions. If we want, we could write this out in reaction form. I don't know if I want to write out every step, but this reaction here was the negative delta HF of MgCl2. And so we're flipping the sign of our delta HF. And then you can take Mg solid to Mg gas. Like, and this is helpful if you know the delta HF of magnesium gas. And we have the Cl2 gas to two chlorine atoms. And that's two times the delta HF of chlorine. And we could keep going. You could write Mg gas to Mg plus, Mg plus to Mg2 plus. Yeah. So on the exam, given all those values, I mean, I think on the practice test, there's almost like three versions of the questions that we tend to ask in this topic. One is just what's uphill, what's downhill, what's positive, what's negative. Another question we've asked is like giving a diagram like this and then asking, well, what's the lattice energy? Or giving the lattice energy and asking for like the delta HF of MgCl2 or something. Like we could give you this number here and say, well, if you know this is 2524 KJs, then you can solve for the delta HF of one of those values. Uh, we could then also give you, like we did in the lecture example, and there's, I think, a practice exam problem that does this, where we give you like a table of data, where we give you like the delta HF of the ionic compound, of the gaseous metal atom, of the gaseous nonmetal atom, and then ionization energies and electron affinities. And so, yeah, we can give it like a numerical example too. The delta HF is multiplied by two. So if you're looking at this in terms of, if we give you the delta HF of chlorine, and then the delta HF of Cl2, of course, is zero because that's the elemental form of chlorine. And so then the delta H of that reaction would be two times the delta HF of chlorine. We could also give you instead, and I think we tend not to do this on exam because it gets a little complicated of how you use the information, but we could give you the bond strength of the Cl-Cl bond in which case you would use that as just you know times one. So it's sort of that the, if we, let's take a detour for a minute. The chart works of summing up all those values is that, um, that we're just doing Hess's law, that we're just going from one, like we're going from MgCl2 to the elements, to the elements in their gas state, and then to the plus, the two plus, and then the minus, and then to the compound. And so we're just kind of following a law from a Hess's Law perspective as well, if we want to write out the reactions. Now that obviously takes a while to write reactions out. And so it's, it's a tricky question for us to put on the test. Like if we give you, like the practice, like the lecture example we did uh, when we covered this topic, that problem takes like five minutes. And so it's kind of a tricky problem for us to put onto a test. Um, now the thing that's interesting is that sometimes we think forming Mg2 plus is stable, right? Because like we talk about how um, forming that noble gas count is stable, but you see it still takes energy. So it doesn't release energy to form it, it still takes energy. So it's still endothermic reactions to get to Mg2+. It's only downhill to make 
um, the chloride ion from chlorine. So it's exothermic when we put the electron on chlorine, but not that much exothermic. It's the combination of the ions is exothermic. So the lattice energy downward is exothermic. And then the formation from the elements to MgCl2 is negative. So when we make the compound from its elements, that the delta HF of the compound is negative. Now, there's going to be compounds that exist that aren't necessarily negative. Like if you look at carbon, for example, as being graphite, making things like ethanol, it's possible you can make a compound from like graphite, and the delta HF of the compound won't necessarily be negative. So not every compound has to have a negative delta HF to be stable, but when you see just like an atom, like magnesium and chlorine being negative, it helps you understand why MgCl2 forms. Um, you know, especially when we think of of having really no ionic forces of attraction, and we have those ionic bonds intact, those electrostatic forces of attraction. Okay, so I think that probably does justice. If there's uh, more questions, I'm sure I could dig up one off a practice quiz or something that we could look at next time. Let's take the CLCL goes to two CL that the chapter eight concept would be, well, that's just the, this delta H of reaction would just equal the bond strength of the chlorine-chlorine bond. And that bond strength is about 242 or 244 kJs per mole. And so that's how you could get the delta H of that reaction is 244. Or we could say that the delta HF of Cl is equal to 122 kJs per mole. There's two moles, you get 244. And so that's the other side is that the reason why I move on to a couple other topics. Um, and like the, uh, th there's a packet, if you haven't seen it in the lecture files, for like a midterm three set of review problems that I'm working from. These are largely just from, I think an old practice exam that may not even be posted anymore. So hopefully these are questions that you haven't seen before and that we can look at and try to see if we can solve these problems and understand them. It also kind of, like the real exam, will wander through chapters seven through nine kind of randomly so we get a good chance to see the topics kind of inside and out, just like you will have to encounter them on the test. So this question here asks us to describe the bonding according to valence bond theory of CF4. Um, valence bond theory and like hybrid orbital theory are the ones that are saying that bonds form due to overlap. So when we look at CF4, we get a tetrahedral molecule, fact, let me, draw it differently. So usually when I'm sketching a geometry of tetrahedral, if I get into the habit of sketching it the same way, then maybe I can picture the tetrahedral shape better. So I get a CF4 molecule, no lone pairs on carbon, four single bonds to fluorine. And so that means that we have a tetrahedral carbon. That also means in terms of our bonding models that we go sp3. Now sp2 is what trigonal planar molecules would do, and then sp hybridization is what linear molecules would do. So if we had something like BF3 being trigonal planar, 120 degree bond angles, this would be sp2 hybridization of that boron. And then if we had something like carbon dioxide being linear, that this would be sp hybridization of that central carbon atom. And so the hybridization is which orbitals of the central atom hybridize to make the orbitals that the non-central atoms bond with. And so for CF4, this is gonna have to be sp3, meaning we're gonna have orbitals pointing in this direction here by taking the s and then all three of the 2p orbitals. So it's kind of looking at carbon and saying, well, if it's a 2s2, thinking of just its normal configuration of just an ordinary carbon atom. And you see it has available all of these three orbitals. If they all three hybridize, that's where we get the sp3. You could call it the 2s, 2p3, if that helps, you know, from the 2s orbitals and the 2p orbitals hybridizing together. But the key is you take four atomic orbitals, and then those hybridize into four hybrid orbitals. And so we get the four hybrid orbitals pointing in the direction that we want them to point. And again, this isn't, this is a bonding model. This doesn't mean the orbitals necessarily do this. Um, so it's just a theory for trying to understand how we get overlap between the atoms. And so then fluorine, just being a single atom, um, what we can think of fluorine is just, well, what's its largest orbital? The answer would be a 2p. So when we think of fluorine, we're thinking 2s2 and then 2p 
with an open valence shell. So we get an open valence in a 2P orbital. So that 2P is what's gonna overlap with um, the SP3 orbital. So we're gonna get overlap of those two electrons in an SP3 with a 2P. So we get SP3 for the carbon and then 2P for the fluorine atom overlapping with each other. And so then the key would be that SP2, 2P overlap would occur maybe in something like BF3. So BF3 would have SP2 and then 2P overlap. So we get 2P, SP2, and BF3. And CO2, we might get 2P and then SP overlap. You might also look at oxygen here and say, well, if oxygen has three domains, maybe we can call oxygen SP2. So maybe in CO2, you could call this SP, SP2 over, overlap. And so you're just trying to describe the overlap and some sort of bonding model for the atoms. And so maybe something like sp21s, that might be like bh3, so a 1s would be hydrogen, maybe something like hydrogen overlapping with boron and bh3. And then 2p, 2p overlap might be something we get in maybe just Cl2, or excuse me, um, like something like F2. Cl2 would be 3p, 3p. So if F2, the largest orbitals are p orbitals, and those are just gonna be overlapping with each other to make that single bond in F2. So perhaps in F2 we get 2p, 2p overlap. Um, so just thinking about hybrid orbital theory, kind of tells us linear SP, trigonal planar SP2, uh, tetrahedral SP3 uh, bonding. We then get the orbitals that aren't part of the hybridization set making up the pi bonds. So you could see that in CO2, we leave behind 1p orbital and then a second p orbital. So there's two p orbitals that aren't hybridized, see it's sp, and then there's, so the other two p orbitals aren't hybridized, they can pi bond. And so we make these pi bonds in CO2. So we can make two pi bonds when we see CO2. We'd say two sigma bonds plus two pi bonds. So the pi bonds <coughs> arising from the overlapping p orbitals. So one of the things that we get from hybrid orbital theory is a picture for pi bonding due, uh, rising due to overlap of the p orbitals that aren't part of the hybridization set. So for sp3, we're not getting pi bonding, right? Because we have no leftover p orbitals for sp3. One like side effect that's, or um, side problem, SO4 two minus. Remember how we had this issue with SO4 two minus of, do we go with the Lewis structure that has all single bonds which looks like this one here. And then the geometry, because we have four bonds, no lone pairs on sulfur, would be tetrahedral. So we definitely have a tetrahedral sulfur. But do you remember how we had that question, do we make double bonds um, in the Lewis structure? So do we go ahead and minimize the magnitudes of our formal charge? And I think you might say, well, what orbitals are gonna make that double bond? If we think of double bonds being a sigma and a pi, we have no p orbitals left over to overlap to make those pi bonds. And so that kind of would suggest that we're probably not really making those double bonds. So when we're thinking of this Lewis structure here, I suppose we can still call it a valid Lewis structure according to the way the book describes the problem, but you can see in terms of a bonding model, we have a bit of a hard problem trying to understand what orbitals would ever overlap to make those double bonds. The answer is there really aren't any orbitals that would make those double bonds. And then we'd even have a hard time picturing how these are gonna resonate over to here, but somehow if we picture that Lewis structure, you just have to imagine somehow, some way, those double bonds resonate through the molecule. Uh, remember, we had shown a structure for like nitrate and for uh, benzene that shows like a set of orbitals that allows those p orbitals to overlap simultaneously. So we have a, a nice picture when we have like an actual like sp2 center for these molecules that allow there to be p orbitals that simultaneously overlap. Um, and so for SO4 two minus, you might say, well, I'm not really getting those double bonds through our bonding models. So for SP3, no double bonds would be possible within those bonding models. Okay. So which ion below um, contains five unpaired electrons? So this comes back to the electron configurations of cations from chapter seven. So in cations, remember, we lose the electrons first 
from the largest orbitals. So those are the highest n orbitals with the highest l value, or the largest orbitals. And so this is where, when we were looking, say, at iron 2 plus, this isn't necessarily the answer to the question, but iron 0 might be where we start. So iron 0's configuration would be an argon, 4s2, 3d6, it's 6 across. And so our largest orbital is the highest n, which is 4, with the highest l, which would be the 4s. So the two electrons we'd kick off first of iron would be the 4s2. So the configuration of iron would be a 3d6, so we have to put six electrons into our D set. So iron two plus should have four unpaired electrons. So that's not the answer to the question. Um, only has four unpaired electrons. Chromium three plus. So again, we go to chromium zero, the neutral charge chromium uh, would be a argon four S two 3d4. Now you might remember this is one of the anomalous configurations. You may forget that as well, but it, it almost doesn't matter if you remember that or not because we're kicking these two off here first. We're going to 3 plus. So we got to kick one out from here. So chromium 3 plus will be a 3d3 configuration. And so even if you had started from the 4s1 3d5, then you just kick one out and then two out down to three. So you get the same configuration for the cation. So for the most part, there's like maybe an exception or two, like um, copper plus is a tricky one where we probably need to know the anomaly for copper plus. We tend not to ask that one. So usually you don't need to know if an element has an anomalous configuration to still get the cation configuration correct. So we'd only have three unpaired electrons because we'd have our 3D orbitals each with uh, a spin paired electron. Uh, for ma manganese 2 plus, this is probably going to be the answer here because manganese is the argon 4s2, 3d5. So we kick the 2 out of the 4s by rule, the largest electrons first. So then we have our 5 spin paired electrons. So we have 5 unpaired electrons for manganese. And then cobalt is a d7, so it's a 4s2, 3d7, kick 2 out. So we go from a 4s2. 3d7 to just a 3d7, and so a 3d7 would have three unpaired electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven. So three unpaired for cobalt two plus. And so that would make manganese two plus the answer here. So again, just making sure we remember how to get um, cation configurations. The key is that the configurations don't follow from the way we put the electrons in. When we were thinking of of iron going 4s2, then 3d6, that the 4s2 come off first. Because those are further away, they have a lower attraction to the nucleus. So the reason why the largest electrons are lost first is because they have a lower ionization energy. So they're easier to ionize. Well, if you're comparing, if you're comparing in the same n row, so if you're comparing a 3s to a 3p to a 3d, yes. But if you're comparing to the 4s, which is now much bigger. So the, the, if, if you, it sort of comes back to, you might remember we did some of these pictures where we would look at like a 1s2, 2s2, 2p set of orbitals, and a 3s, 3p. And then we'd look at the 4s out here. And then the 3d is coming back into this space here. So yeah. So then, uh, yes. Okay, so then lattice energies are um, resulting from the uh, um, electrostatic force of attraction of charge. So this kind of follows along from Coulomb's law, the energy of electrostatic attraction equal to kappa Q1, Q2 divided by D. And so the higher the magnitudes of charge, and then one's positive, one's negative, then the greater the magnitude of the energy of attraction. Now I go to magnitudes here because plus and minus charge make the energy negative. So the greater charged ions makes the energy more negative. And I like thinking of, I think it's harder to picture things that are more negative. Um, it's harder to picture that. But it's easier, I think, to think of the magnitude of the attraction being greater the higher the magnitudes of charge. So we make the charges higher. We make the energy of attraction greater. 
Therefore, we require more energy to separate the ions. And so then the closer we can get the ions together as well is better. So being closer when you're charged is better because you can experience a greater attraction, therefore require more energy to separate. And so being higher charged and being closer or being smaller. So MgO versus um, calcium uh, sulfide, the greater lattice energy is an MgO. They're both two plus two minuses. So it comes down to the smaller ions. So the smaller ions, closer together, harder to separate. And then for MgS versus NaCl, two plus two minus versus plus minus, being more highly charged requires more energy to separate. So it's gonna be about a factor of four higher for MgS. So um, earlier I was kind of gonna mention for like ionic compounds about 800 up to thousands of kJs per mole for bond strengths. If you think of covalent bonds like Cl2, CH, CC bonds, they're closer to like two to 400 kJs per mole. So ionic bonds a lot stronger than the covalent bonds due to this exchanging of charge or um, uh, attraction of the charges. And so MgS is going to be higher compared to NaCl. So it should be MgO and MgS. So when sulfur trioxide dissolves in water, what type of compound forms? This is coming from like the end of chapter seven where we were talking about metal oxides react with water to form bases or basic solutions. And then the non-metal oxides react with water when they react to form acids. And in some cases like this one here, you can actually write the reaction out and balance it pretty easily. This is gonna form H2SO4. We mentioned that sometimes it's hard to balance out how you go from the water to the acid, just that though you form an acid product. That's kind of the key. And an example of the metal oxide might be something like K2O reacting in water to dissolve into the ions of potassium and oxide, and then oxide just reacts with water to form hydroxide ion. And so the oxide ion pulls off an H plus, makes OH minus, and then that leaves behind another OH minus. And so we're making OH minuses by the dissolution of metal oxides in water. It doesn't mean that all metal oxides dissolve in water. Like iron oxides are generally not soluble in water, so we're not predicting water solubility of oxides. In fact, we didn't even see them on our solubility chart, but if they dissolve in water, then they're going to form a basic solution due to forming these hydroxide salts. Um, and so um, metal oxides that dissolve in water go um, basic, and then the, metal ox the non metal oxides that dissolve in water go acidic. So this here is going to form an acid. Now, the other choices like non electrolyte versus ionic compound, um, this is making sure that we you know, look at things like HCl or H2SO4 and recognize that despite the fact that they form ions in water, they don't exist as ions in their molecular form. Like you can have pure H2SO4, you can have pure HCl, um, in which case those compounds are not ionic, they're just molecular in that they're actually forming a compound like HCl where we have a covalent bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine. Now it's not a uh, uh, purely covalent bond, it's, a, it's polarized, but it's still one where we have electrons being shared between H and Cl. So this is still a molecular compound, not an ionic compound. So just making sure we see why the ionic compound's not a good answer. And then a non-electrolyte would be a compound that doesn't ionize in water, and we're getting compounds that ionize, like acids ionize and bases ionize in water. And so that's why answer C would be wrong. So, what, was the, what was your first question? Oh, because we still have a single bond. So for it to be ionic, it would have to be H plus Cl minus. So that would be ionic. And, but it's not fully ionic. Like, in fact, we calculated, well, we didn't personally calculate the charges, but we did for HF in an example in class and found that the charges were about 0.44 units of charge. So plus 0.4 for H, about minus 0.4 for F. And if you repeat that problem for HCl, it's about point, uh, point 0.2, somewhere in there. So nowhere near plus one, minus one. And so that means that we still have what you would describe as a single bond between the H and the chlorine, though polarized. 
that we still have a dipole pointing towards chlorine, more negative charge on chlorine, but not fully a minus one. Okay, so electron affinity of F is negative 328 kJs per mole, which statement is true. So when a mole of fluorine gains an electron, is energy released or absorbed? Well, let's write out our reaction. So electron affinity is the, of F, is F absorbing an electron to go to F minus. So that's what the electron affinity reaction means. And that the delta H or the delta E of this reaction be equal to minus 328 kJs per mole. So when one mole of fluorine absorbs an electron, 328 kJs is released from this reaction, would be the correct statement. And so let's read the other statements and make sure we understand why they're wrong. And so then when a mole of F loses an electron, 328 kilojoules is released. So that might be, like if we had said the ionization energy of F was minus 328, which it isn't, but if we had said the ionization energy of F was this number, then that's what this statement would be consistent with. So this is not ionization energy, this is electron affinity. So then we also have when a mole of F gains an electron, energy is absorbed. That would be the conclusion if this electron affinity were positive in value, not negative. Most electron affinities are negative, and the negative is coming from the electron being attracted into the nucleus. So that electron, if it has attraction to the nucleus, if it has an orbital that it can go into that's not particularly high in energy, in some of the cases like nitrogen uh, group was close to zero or slightly positive because we were spin pairing an electron, which causes some repulsion energy. And so in some cases we see spin pairing costs a little bit of energy. Um, that the noble gases are really high energy. In fact, they don't even form stable atoms with that minus charge because they go into such a high energy orbital that the electron would just fall off the atom. Um, and so then, um, so negative for most of our delta H's for our electron affinities. So statement C is wrong because that would be true if it were positive, not negative. And statement D, when a mole of F loses an electron, energy is absorbed. This has nothing to do with F losing electrons, this is all about F gaining electrons. Now, there could be a statement about F minus losing an electron. If we said, is it true that fluoride, when it loses an electron, that 328 kilojoules must be absorbed, then that statement would, would be true. If you look at the opposite reaction of F minus goes to F plus an electron, that because we flipped this reaction, that the delta H has to be plus 328 kJs so when a mole of fluoride loses an electron, 328 kilojoules has to be absorbed. So we could talk maybe about F minus losing an electron relative to electron affinity value because they're linked by the reaction. What is the formal charge of phosphorus in the Lewis structure of phosphate ion in which all the atoms obey the octet rule? And so the wording of this question kind of gets at, you know, when you need to make a choice on something like phosphate of which Lewis structure to go with, we're told here to choose the one that satisfies the octet rule. So in terms of the Lewis structure, I'd be adding up five for phosphorus, six for the O's in terms of our valence count, adding in the three electrons for the three minus charge. So it should give us a total of 32 valence electrons. So central phosphorus, four oxygens, octet for the non-centrals with lone pairs. Count up the electrons used. That's 32 total. So I have none left over. So no lone pairs onto phosphorus. So I have phosphorus with four single bonds to O. Phosphorus is now satisfying the octet rule. So are the oxygens. And so this would be the Lewis structure, which satisfies the octet rule for all atoms. And then in terms of the formal charge of phosphorus, we're just breaking these bonds in half and then kind of saying, well, what would the charge of this be? So if I have phosphorus with four valence electrons, well, phosphorus with five valence electrons would have a zero charge. And so we have one fewer, so that gives us a net charge of plus. How do I know that? Well, I can do five, should give it a neutral charge. There's only four here, so I have a net plus one charge. Uh, we could do 
the bonding electron pairs times a half. There's an equation in the book. I don't like using the equation though because sometimes we misapply equations. But we take all the lone pairs that might be on an atom and then half of the bonding pairs. So that's where we just break the bonds in half to get our formal charges. Doesn't ask for O, but oxygen should have six valence electrons and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven surrounding it. So each of the O's are minus one formal charged. Okay, so formal charge is just the charge an atom would bear in a molecular ion if the bonds are equally shared. So if we have purely covalent bonds. I didn't circle the answer here, but it would be plus one for phosphorus. Well, each oxygen would be minus one. So usually you would look at it like oxidation numbers, like a per atom. So if it said, what about O? Minus one. And there's four of them. So the total from the four O's would be minus four. Um, and then if the question had said, well, what about the Lewis structure of phosphorus that, that minimizes magnitudes of formal charge? So what if we had said, what about, what about the other Lewis structure of phosphate, where you would come up with this Lewis structure? And the answer here would be zero. So we get a zero formal charge on that phosphorus and on the oxygen with the double bond, and then minuses on the other oxygens. So we could look at formal charge um, within a different Lewis structure following a different rule. So again, we're just breaking our bonds. So we have phosphorus with five electrons. I didn't. Yeah. All right, so the pi bond between the two carbon atoms and ethylene is formed between what? Okay, so this is from hybrid orbital theory. in chapter nine. And so in hybrid orbital theory, we'd be looking at our carbon. Well, first we'd have to have maybe a Lewis structure would help. So we have C2H4, so CH2, CH2. And then to give carbon four bonds, to have the proper number of electrons shown, we go with a double bond. And so we'd have this double bond here. We'd have two trigonal planar carbons. And so the, they'll be sp2 hybridized. So just to get 120 degree bond angles to get four domains, we go sp2. So we get these sp2 orbitals here. The sigma bond, the single bond between the double, remember the double bond is a sigma plus a pi. The sigma arises from sp2, sp2 overlap. So we get that overlapping of those sp orbitals. Remember a sigma bond is on the bond axis. It's like a line bond. It's a, it's a simple bond. A, 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 bond axis symmetric bond. Um, so a lot of different ways you can think of what the sigma means. I think like symmetrical about the bond axis is kind of what the sigma means. And then you can think pi is planar about the bond axis. So the planar bond arises from the unhybridized p orbitals. So our sp2 set, we have three p orbitals. So one of the p's wasn't hybridized. So those p orbitals that aren't hybridized overlap to make that pi bond. So our pi bond is our 2p, 2p overlap. So the overlapping of the 2p orbitals aren't hybridized. So we get our 2p, 2p overlap. So the overlapping of the two 2p orbitals of carbon make up the pi bond. So the double bond's a sigma and a pi. The sigma is the sp2, sp2 overlap in this molecule. And then the hydrogens, if we said, well, describe this bond here we'd say that that's 1s sp2 overlap. So 1s of hydrogen, sp2 of carbon. I feel like Indiana Jones is gonna pop out of the vent or something. <laughs> um, what is the electron domain and uh, molecular geometries of PO3, three minus? So PO3, 3 minus, 5 plus 3 times 6 plus 3. So that's 26 electrons. So 26 electrons will give us this Lewis structure to start. Single bond your non-centrals to the central atom. 
then count electrons, so that's 24. We have 26, though, available, so the two electrons left over go on to phosphorus. So that it's really probably the hardest part of this question is making sure we see those two electrons there, and then we have a chance to get the structure correct. Um, we don't need a double bond. The formal charge of phosphorus is zero, minus on the O's. So we're good in terms of a Lewis structure. We, if we made a double bond, we'd be maximizing the formal charge. We'd be going from zero to plus one on phosphorus, or excuse me, from zero to um, minus one on phosphorus. So just making sure we see why we don't do this is that notice that would be minus charged for phosphorus instead of zero. So we don't maximize charge with double bonds. We sometimes minimize charge if it satisfies the octet rule, and we can expand the octet rule if we're told to in the problem, like we did on sulfate previously and phosphate previously. So for phosphite, we have this lone pairs. So we have three domains that are bonding, one domain that's non-bonding. So I have four total domains. So my electron domain geometry comes about from four domains in total. And so that's tetrahedral. So I have a tetrahedral electron domain. That means if I'm thinking of my geometry, let me put the electron pair maybe here, and oxygen here, and then I have this as my structure. And so in terms of the molecular geometry name, we're just trying to name the shape of these atoms here. Um, I mentioned before, it's kind of peculiar that you just try to name the geometry of the bonds and the atoms, despite the fact the lone pair contributes to the geometry. We just say, well, what would you name this shape? And try to give a name for that shape, and the best name if you're thinking of, okay, if we've settled on tetrahedral, I suppose we already know the answer because there's only one possible answer. But trigonal pyramidal is the shape here. We get a trigonal and then pyramid emerge from that shape. So you're just trying to name the shape of the atoms that results from the electron domain geometry. So electron pair stays there. It doesn't leave, doesn't change the shape of the molecule. When we think of the molecular geometry, we just try to name the atoms and neglecting the electron pair just from the shape of the molecule. Not from contributing to the shape, just from being part of the name. So we go tetrahedral electron domain and then trigonal parameter molecular geometry. Um, for the most part, it's Lewis structure to the geometries. I mean, getting the right Lewis structure is obviously very important. I remember when this question was on the test. This is kind of a weird question. Um, this might even be still on one of the practice exams. Um, so a potential energy diagram is shown. What might it... What's that? Why would you do trigonal Well, trigonal planar would have, would have no lone pairs. So if we have a central atom with three bonding domains and no lone pairs, so tr uh, trigonal planar would be the trigonal is in the same plane as that central atom. And so the electron pair is forcing it into tetrahedral. So what could be represented here? Um, we have helium, helium, sodium, sodium, ion, and then HH. Well, HH is not represented here because when we brought the two hydrogens together, what they do is they do this, or they form some sort of a stable bond where this goes below zero in terms of the relative energy because we're making a stable bond. So anytime you make a stable bond, you go downhill in energy relative to separating the atoms because then you have to imagine H2 to break its bond, energy has to be absorbed in to break the bond. So if we're down here in terms of H2, we want to break the bond, energy has to be absorbed. Um, so hydrogen, anytime we make a stable bond, you take plus minus, goes down as well. So anytime you take a plus ion and a minus ion together, opposite charges go downhill in energy. Now you usually reach a point where you can't press the ions together any further, their nuclei start repelling. So you usually reach some sort of bond uh, length that's optimal, and then the energy starts to go back up. And so the energy just goes up because of nuclear repulsion. If we push the nuclei too close together. And then the bond's forming negative because you get electron nuclear attraction. So you have hydrogen and another hydrogen, each of those electrons being attracted to the other nuclei. And so that electron nuclear attraction is driving the energy down. And then if you keep pressing too far, you get the two positive charged nuclei repelling each other, the energy goes up. 
And then, well, what happens if you take two atoms that don't form a bond together? Like two helium atoms, two noble gases, if we remember the um, MO diagram looks something like this, where we had two electrons in a bonding orbital and then two electrons in an anti-bonding orbital. And so in helium-2, we end up with no net bond that could form between the atoms because we tried to overlap the orbitals and then the orbitals just kind of broke itself with the anti-bonding orbital. So our bond order, if you remember, was equal to zero for helium-2, meaning that there's no stable bond for helium. And so when helium tries to overlap with itself, it just goes up in energy. So there's no net attraction between helium, only repulsion. And so that would describe helium and also two like charged particles. If you take any particles of like charge, plus pluses, minus minuses, um, that if you bring two negatively charged particles together, that they're going to repel each other as well. So we need an opposite set of charges to lead to attraction. A similar set of charges leads to repulsion, or two atoms that just can't make a stable bond together like two noble gases. So noble gases are noble because they don't form bonds together like the hydrogen atoms do. Which molecule below contains uh, an sp hybridized atom? Well, for this structure here, we got to do four like Lewis structures to see. So sp hybridization should come about from any of the molecules that are linear in molecular geometry. And so for SF2, 20 valence electrons. So central sulfur, two fluorines. That's 16 electrons. The four left over, lone pairs on sulfur. And so then this looks linear, right? But it's not linear. Like, it's not linear because this is tetrahedral electron domain, so it's going to go bent. So the real shape of sulfur, electron pair, electron pair, then we end up with this bent bond that's definitely not 180 degrees. And so we get an sp3 hybridized central atom in sf2, not sp. So pf3, likewise. I have a bit of a problem. I'm not going to get a linear molecule with three atoms on phosphorus. So I know right off the bat, like SP has to come from just there being two atoms bonded. So this really can't possibly be SP. If we want to know for sure what it is, phosphorus, four fluorines, or excuse me, three fluorines, lone pairs on the F. Our total count is five for phosphorus, three times seven for the chlorines. That's 26 electrons. And so we've used 24 so far. The two left over go on phosphorus. So the two electrons left over, lone pair onto phosphorus. And so this just like PO3, three minus is going to be a tetrahedral sp3 central atom in terms of the electron domain geometry. And so not sp. And then BEF2 sounds like a good possibility. We only have two valence electrons for beryllium, 14 for the two Fs, that's 16 total electrons, so that's central beryllium, two fluorines, no lone pairs on beryllium. And a zero formal charge, so we don't even have to make double bonds, so we're good with this Lewis structure. And so then we end up with a perfectly 180 degree bond angle, and then we could think linear bond, um, two atoms attached to it, so sp hybridization. And then CH2O is going to go trigonal planar. So CH2O will have carbon, oxygen, single bond hydrogens. If we started here, we'll make a double bond to minimize the magnitudes of formal charge. So we end up with formaldehyde here, trigonal planar, so that's sp2. So sp2 central carbon in CH2O. Uh, one of the things you can see is if you have like um, four things attached, it's not going to be sp. If you have like um, SF4, can't be sp2. Um, the hybridization sets for trigonal uh, bipyramidal and octahedral we don't go into. Um, so you may have learned, who remembers learning sp3d and sp3d2? Does anybody ever remember learning that? Um, those were like hybridization sets that used to be used for the five and six total domains. 
we don't talk about those anymore. Those hybridization sets really aren't particularly real. It's kind of funny, the SP3 isn't real either, but that's, I don't know, that's for another day. That's why we keep saying these are models. Um, but those are models too, but those are models that are completely fiction. <laughs> there is some utility in SP3 versus SP2 versus SP though. The P orbital overlap is a really good picture of pi orbital overlap that really is pretty accurate for what goes on in molecules. Okay, um, let's look at this question here. Counting, like there's, there's like a few different variations of this question here. One could be, you know, counting like the question says, how many sp2 hybridized carbon atoms are in the molecule? Well, if we just hybridize everything, sp3, because there's four, four domains on that carbon, we get sp2 here for this carbon. That oxygen's sp2, but it's an oxygen, not a carbon. This carbon here has three domains. That's also sp2. This is also sp2. I'm just like really counting one, two, three domains to come up with sp2. And then we'd have sp for carbon and nitrogen here for being linear, um, two domains total for each of them. And so it looks like I have a total of three sp2 carbons. Another variation of this question though might say how many sigma and pi bonds are there in the molecule? So if the question asked that instead, how would we answer that? Well, what we do is the single bonds are a sigma and the doubles are a sigma and a pi and the triples are a sigma and two pi. So let's start here. So this would be a sigma and two pi. This is a sigma plus a pi as is this. And so I get, if I'm counting my sigmas, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sigma bonds. If I'm counting the pi, I get one, two, three, and then four. So our triple bonds being two pi's in the sigma and the double bonds being the sigma and the pi. Now the reason why or like how you get this is the SP-SP overlap, if we just like maybe look at one of these a little bit further and try to say, well, wait, why is it a sigma and two pi again? Well, if you're looking at this carbon here and saying it's sp, means you have an orbital this direction and an orbital this direction, and the nitrogen's also sp, so it has an orbital this direction, an orbital that direction. One of the sp orbitals gets the lone pair, and then the other one is making this sigma bond. So the sp-sp overlap is our sigma between the triple bond between c and n, and then we have the leftover p orbitals overlapping for one pi bond and then two pi bonds. It's hard to picture, but we get the pi set one direction, the pi set sticking out of the page for the second pi bond. So the PP overlap is a pi, and we get this times two for the triple bond CN. All right, I'll just glance question and see here. Um, between B, C, N, O, which atom when bonded to F makes the most polar bond? And so the most polar bond, the least polar would be F itself. That would be exactly nonpolar. So have a dipole moment of zero. We want the atom with the lowest electronegativity. Our electronegativity increases towards F. So as far away from F is better to have a greater difference of electronegativity. So the greatest difference of electronegativity negativity would be the BF bond. The OF bond, you might think, I mean, maybe if you were just thinking quickly, you might think the two most electronegative atoms should be polar. Well, their difference of electronegativity isn't that great. So it makes the difference not particularly big. Um, let's start with this problem on Wednesday. So when it comes to size, we think left to right trends, or we think um, our uh, isoelectronic series. So we'll pick up from that problem on, when on Wednesday. If you have other topics, other questions you want to see, just send me an email or let me know. All right, guys, have a great day. Like rank the molecules.
bomb it. If it, if it or to like give you the MO diagram of the question, or, or somehow try to signify, because it should be like qualified but according to one theory. And the MO theory is usually the one that's right. Okay. And like just the Lewis structure theory, sometimes you may get it wrong. Like for example, this one, if I use Lewis structure, it did not work. Like, yeah, that quadruple bond between the carbon, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's like what the MO theory shows. Well, you're never going to get a quadruple bond. Um, so it never said it. I would say then argue after the fact, or like like hopefully we would clean it up on the test and okay. clearly say. Clearly. Yeah. Because okay. probably the, the um, one tiny thing, maybe it was lost in translation of this test. I think. On a test, it said like use this diagram for like, the next four questions, and maybe that tagline was lost. And you're given this diagram. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. one more thing, I don't understand when you say like the entire molecule is polar, but the bonds are nonpolar, or like the vice versa. Well, design. the vice versa could be true. Like if the bonds are nonpolar, then the molecule should be nonpolar regardless How of the would geometry. How you know? Like if well, the bonds. Well, well, the electric activities are so similar. Okay. You'd have a hard time knowing without a chart. Yeah. Um, and and this does get like kind of weirdly. It's weird. Like an ozone, for example, they're both O's, so you would think the bond should be nonpolar. But then the Lewis structure has a difference of charge just based on formal charges. So ozone actually does end up being polar and it actually has, I would say, polar bonds. But ordinarily, you'd look at like CLCL -CL bonded normally, mm -hmm. would have the same electric activities would be nonpolar. So on an exam, if we're not given the chart, would we be expected to find like specific bonds? Like, I don't think we would ever give you a molecule that happens to have nonpolar bonds, but is situated in such a way that it could be polar if they were polar, and then expect you so to know that. So it would be the same. Yeah, because like in some cases, you just need the chart to really know. Right. And even then, it's like, well, a difference of negativity of anything is enough to make something be at least somewhat polar. You know what I mean? Even if the atoms have a slight difference of negativity, it even then gets more complicated. NCl3 mm -hmm. is trigonal pyramidal. Mm -hmm. So it should be polar, but N and C all have the exact same electric negativities, but the molecule still has a bad polar. Right. So I mean, it's not exactly zero. Okay. So it's it's really weird. Okay. So I don't go too deep on so it. Wouldn't be but but the thing that's deeper is the molecules with polar bonds that just are arranged in such a way that they cancel out, yeah. where the center charge is the center of the molecule. Yeah. That those are the ones you're expected to know are non-polar. So there is a so. question with like a central molecule and then two of the same atoms. Like, I don't know, X, E, C, L on two sides oh, okay. F, but it was still polar. Does it not cancel, even though there's two of the same? Yeah, like X, E, two fluorines should be nonpolar. Two fluorines and then like two something else. Oh, I mean, it, it depends like it, where they're situated. So like if one of the ones is like P, F2, and then CL3. Okay. So if the CL3s are in the middle, no. the F2s are opposite. Then it would cancel. Those would cancel. Okay. And then if we have like the, the two Fs here, and then chlorine, 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 then they wouldn't exactly Oh, because the tetrahedral wouldn't cancel, because it's not exactly a... Yeah, that's the other one that, like, I mean, these examples could be really deep. I think we try to keep them fairly simple, but like, for like, carbon F, 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 nonpolar, but F, F, C, L, C, L, Would be polar, polar. yeah. Okay. All right, thank you yep. so much. Are pi bonds always going to be unhybridized? As in, they won't be SP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the pi bonds w would always arise from the p orbitals that aren't hybridized. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, the only way I could say, but I don't think we would ask this, would be like in like sulfate with the double bonds. Those don't come from that overlap because there's no leftover p orbitals to do that. But then you would just be left with, we have no idea then how to describe those bonds. And the answer is they don't form. <laughs> it's the real answer. I don't know why I just teach it that way. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, for this question, I was wondering why, um, why would fluorine, uh, since like uh, we have fluorine like this, why would it not hybridize into uh, the sp3 as well? Sp3. Yeah, you know, I think that's not a choice, right? So I don't think sp3, sp3 was a choice. So I think that wouldn't be a bad choice. You know what I mean? So I think you could think of it that way too. I think whenever the atoms have like a like one lone pair, like one electron that's unpaired. And it's, you know what orbital it's in, just makes it like easier just to not even worry about the hybridization set. Okay. And so then you can see the overlap without hybridizing. Okay. So that's probably the simplest explanation is you don't need to hybridize it to see what overlap you get. And we almost started this from like H, like F or H, I think we did HCl was 1S, 3P. And then we were like, well, what do you do when it's like a carbon? And the answer is, well, you look at these hybrid orbitals. So you don't need to necessarily hybridize. 
hybridize. Yeah, you don't need to hybridize it, but you can. That's not wrong. I wouldn't say it's wrong to say that the CF4 bond is SV3, SV3 overlap. Yeah. That just wasn't a choice. Though. It, it could yeah. be. Yeah. Okay, and for this one, um, so is it just not conventional to only have like one lone electron? Are they always in pairs? Because wouldn't this technically have the most reduced formal charge in the structure? I, I don't think so, because that's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons on phosphorus. Yeah. It's that type of dot. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah, so. So that still doesn't have zero formal okay. charges. Yeah, so I think you just go by rule. Single bond first, count electrons, put leftover electrons on the central atom, you don't, you don't get it right. The, the electron count on the central atom, right? So like, are do atoms like, is it like common for them to have one electron as a lone pair? Not very. Um, like w like when carbon does it, we call it a radical, and it's, it's reactive, so it's not yeah. going to, you're not gonna bottle it or anything. Yeah. Um, and some molecules can exist, like, metal atoms can exist with like a, a lone electron, but those are also more com complicated than what we are really talking about. All right, I just had one last question. Um, my, so would, so yeah, the same thing as an electron would domain, if we were talking about like Oh, yeah, so yeah, like, so, that, so that would be a domain. So if you had like carbon, oh. chlorine, 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 lone pair, but that's still going to be four domains. Oh, if you just want one lone electron, yeah. that, that still counts. It yeah, doesn't need it to still be. Needs, it needs an orbital, right? Yeah. So it's going to, it may not recall it strongly, yeah. Yeah. but it's still going to kick into the geometry that gives it back. So it's being a full domain. Okay. So like, it, so like, it, yeah, there's it, no half Okay. 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 Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, which I, I mean, those molecules are not super common, and they do get a little yeah. bit hairy in terms of some of their structures and properties. So we try not to talk about so many of those nuances. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. I just have one question. So yeah, okay, it's okay, an SP2 atom to have okay. more. Yeah. And, and the reason why I don't say that is because you can also just leave oxygen and say that, um, that you get like two P SP2 overlap and then you get a P orbital overlap. So you can leave mm -hmm. oxygen unhybridized and still come up with the orbitals. So that's why we also try to just like the carbons, because you can't really come up with any other carbons. Okay, yeah. It's easier to picture sometimes not. I don't know. I know the pictures I, make it muddy sometimes. No, like, no I really want to. I just yeah. want to 
So the um, if you talk SD3 facility, you just have like three X, three SD3 